Now we're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, that excellent uh, science-based talk you just heard, to talking about uh, an entity whose biology still seems to elude us. So we will talk about what clinical data there is. And I have chosen to talk about four things. Um, first is the subject of nipple-sparing mastectomy, something we're seeing with increasing frequency. Probably the biggest question in DCIS, is RT necessary for all DCIS? When is sentinel node biopsy indicated and the current status of endocrine therapy? So if we start with mastectomy in DCIS in general, mastectomy is medically indicated when the extent of disease, when the extent of DCIS in the breast is too extensive to remove and leave you with a cosmetically good breast, which interestingly enough occurs more frequently than in T1 breast cancers for reasons we don't understand. The good news is that mastectomy is an extremely effective treatment for DCIS. If we look at an old meta-analysis of traditional mastectomies involving some almost 1,600 patients, the local recurrence rate was only 1.4%. If we look at newer studies of skin sparing mastectomy, the largest of which uh, is a study from Emory that included 223 patients. The chest wall recurrence rate was 3.1%, so not appreciably different, and I will ask you to keep those figures in the back of your head for a minute. So what about nipple-sparing mastectomy? Well, we can do skin-sparing mastectomy and not leave behind breast tissue because the skin of the breast has a layer of subcutaneous fat that provides its blood supply and separates the skin from the breast tissue. That does not exist in the nipple. The ductal structures come straight up into the nipple. There is no subcutaneous fat there. So if you're going to leave a blood supply on the nipple, by definition, you are leaving breast tissue behind in order to keep that blood supply. Now, traditionally, we know that occult nipple involvement is present in somewhere between 6 and 31% of breast cancers, depending on exactly how hard you look for it. That was in old studies, by and large, that antedated the use of breast conserving therapy. So if you think about the fact that if you're doing mastectomy because it's medically necessary because disease is extensive in the breast, one might anticipate that that number would be on the high side. And when we think about nipple sparing mastectomy in DCIS, it's important to remember that most of the published literature addresses invasive breast cancer, not DCIS, which of course starts in the very ductal structures that you're planning on leaving behind. So why do we even talk about nipple sparing mastectomy? Well, because the nipples look good. They look better than reconstructed nipples, although you will notice that in this photo, they're still not quite aimed exactly in the direction where nipples should be aimed. They are rotated slightly upwards and outwards, and they are by and large relatively insensate. So even though they look normal, they don't act exactly like normal nipples. So what do we know about the outcome of nipple sparing mastectomy? Well, the largest experience comes from the European Institute of Oncology. This is a study that just came out in EPUB this year at a median follow-up of 50 months. And what's important to recognize about this study, which is very different than what's done anywhere else, is that all the patients who had their nipples spared received an intraoperative dose of 16 gray to the nipple areolar complex from their intraoperative radiotherapy unit. That is not something that we normally do here. <clears throat> So if you notice, here's invasive cancer, DCIS. You see that local recurrence in the nipple areolar complex itself occurred in about 3% of DCIS cases compared to slightly under 1% in invasive cancer. More, but certainly not an alarming number. But what is also interesting is that there was a 5% rate of local recurrence elsewhere on the chest wall. And as any surgeon who has ever done this operation will tell you, it is an awful operation to do. Even if you do a really lot of breast surgery, it is technically much more difficult than a conventional skin sparing mastectomy because in order to keep this blood supply around the nipple, you can't make the incision around the nipple. The incisions either go out laterally on the breast or they go under the breast, and it's about a mile from here up to the clavicle, which is where the breast stops. So the exposure is poor, and it is definitely technically much more difficult to cut flaps. So studies that present you only the rate of local recurrence in the nipple areolar complex are not giving you the true picture about this study. The other thing that's noteworthy about this is 
These data were originally presented at the San Antonio Breast Symposium a couple years ago in 2009 at a follow-up of only 20 months when they had no recurrences in the NAC and a 1.4% rate of local recurrence overall. Look at how those numbers have changed as the follow-up comes up to 50 months. Since this is a relatively new operation, most of the literature has relatively short follow-up, so I think we don't have the total picture on what the rate of local recurrence is going to be. And like all local recurrences, in patients with DCIS treated with mastectomy, the majority of these are invasive local recurrence. So there's an increased risk due to both retained breast tissue and poor exposure. One other group of patients people are very fond of doing this operation in is BRCA mutation carriers, and the long-term outcome of that is really truly unknown. So I think we can say today that nipple sparing mastectomy is contraindicated in patients who have extensive DCIS that medically necessitates mastectomy or localized DCIS in the subareolar space. So if you want to know what I really think about nipple sparing mastectomy, I think it's a great operation for a woman who doesn't actually need a mastectomy. <laughs> who can be treated with breast-conserving therapy. That's when it's oncologically safe, but you can keep your nipple a different way and it will still be sensate and work. So let's talk about something more important, which is, is RT necessary for all DCIS? So we know that there have been four prospective randomized trials that have asked this question. You will notice that these were trials primarily of mammographically detected DCIS, so somewhere between 70 and 100% of patients had mammographically detected DCIS. None of these trials employed a boost dose, so they could perhaps be considered not studies of an optimal radiotherapy approach. And in only one of these studies was tamoxifen included, and that was the UK-Australia-New Zealand trial, which had an unusual two-by-two two randomization to radiotherapy versus not, tamoxifen versus not, and you could pick which arms you were randomizing into. In spite of all that, if we look at the meta-analysis of these four trials that was performed and 10-year rates of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence, you see that the use of RT results in a highly statistically significant reduction of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence and that this reduction is observed for both invasive recurrences as well as recurrent DCIS. However, if you look at the 10-year survival outcomes because the force of mortality from DCIS is so incredibly low, as you would anticipate, there was no difference in total deaths, there was no differences in deaths without recurrence, and in these relatively more modern studies, there was also no increase in cardiac death at 10 years from the use of radiotherapy. So the endpoint in DCIS management has always been local control, not survival. If you consider that at 15 years, only about 3% of women with DCIS treated with breast conservation die of breast cancer, and 11% of them die of something else. So I think what we can say about the randomized trials is that RT reduces the risk of local recurrence by approximately 50%, and in detailed subset analyses in these trials, a group of patients not benefiting from radiotherapy has not been identified. The magnitude of radiotherapy benefit varies, but a subset of women, whether it's based on age or grade or DCIS morphology, who doesn't get any risk reduction from DCIS has not been identified. So if we look at what was going on a number of years ago, because these trials are old and have been out for a while, the way this graph is set up is this is margin width shown across this axis, and this is grade shown across this axis, and these are the percent of physicians in academic practice who recommend radiotherapy for uh, DCIS. So what you see is that if you have a low to intermediate grade DCIS, which are the pale bars, with a relatively small margin, 95% of physicians would recommend radiotherapy. When it's high grade, that goes up to 100% in this survey. However, if you get out here to the magic margin of one centimeter and you look at low to intermediate grade, you see that just under half of physicians recommend radiotherapy for DCIS. 
So why is this when we have level one evidence that says that radiotherapy reduces the risk of recurrence by half? Well, there have been a number of criticisms regarding the prospect of randomized trials, most notably that none of them specified how to process the tissue, that you had to gross in all of the tissue, and how the pathologist evaluated it. They did not use post-excision mammography to make sure that all of the calcifications were out, and they did not address the issue of margin width. The margins required in these trials was tumor not touching ink. That was the definition of a negative margin, as it should be. So the question is, <laughs> Does wide excision and detailed pathologic examination result in a local control which is equivalent to a smaller excision and radiotherapy? And that is, of course, the hypothesis that has been posed to us by Mel Silverstein over the years. In this study that was published in the New England Journal in 1999, which was a retrospective study of patients in a single institution practice with 93 patients in one arm and 40 patients in the other arm, in which he demonstrated no difference between patients treated with excision alone with a margin of a centimeter or greater and those who were treated with excision and radiotherapy. So we now have in the last couple years two new multi-institutional prospective trials that address this question and I think allow us to put some closure on it finally. So the first of these was the E5194 trial, which was a single arm study of excision alone plus or minus tamoxifen for DCIS at least three millimeters in size, excised to a margin width of at least three millimeters. They like this number. They mandated that the specimen be completely embedded and processed, so the pathologist was looking at all of it and you had to have a post-excision mammogram free of calcifications. It was not mandated about tamoxifen. That was not a randomization, but you could use it or not use it. And so if you look at the patients who were randomized into this trial who were stratified on the basis of grade, if you had low to intermediate grade DCIS, it could be up to 2.5 centimeters in size, but the median size was in fact six millimeters. These were teeny weeny weeny DCISs. And if you had high grade DCIS, it could be up to a centimeter in size. And these were seven millimeters. Almost half of the patients had the magic margin of one centimeter. And about 70% of them had at least five millimeters. And it was planned to give tamoxifen to only about a third of them. So if we look at what this study showed with a median follow-up of 6.3 years, you see that at five years, the in-breast recurrence rate in the high-grade group was quite high. It was 15%. Half of those recurrences were invasive cancer. In the low to intermediate grade group, it was 6%. Look what happens with two more years follow-up. This line is relatively plateaued. This one is continuing to rise. So most people interpreted this to say that excision alone was not a very good approach for high-grade DCIS. Most people would consider a five-year rate of invasive breast cancer of about 8% as not particularly acceptable, but maybe it was okay for lower intermediate-grade DCIS. What I would remind you is we know that the time to recurrence differs in DCIS on the basis of grades. This is a very old study of Larry Solon's. Notice that at five years, this is with radiotherapy. In the low to intermediate grade group, the risk of in-breast recurrence was only 3%. In the high grade group, it was 12%. But if you come out to 10 years, you see these curves come right together. So low grade, intermediate grade DCIS just take longer to recur, but the ultimate risk of recurrence at 10 years is the same. The intergroup study also examined the effect of margin width on local recurrence and noticed that whether you were in the low grade or the high grade group, there was absolutely no difference in local recurrence in this prospective multi-institution study on the basis of a margin width of one centimeter. Big resections make ugly breasts. <laughs> now, the second study that addressed this question was a study that was just presented at ASCO this year from the RTOG, which was the 9084 study, which was a randomized trial in DCIS, and it was for mammographically detected or incidental DCIS of lower intermediate grade 
2.5 centimeters or less in size. So very similar entry criteria to what we just saw in the ECOG study. And again, these three millimeter margins were mandated. This trial was a randomization to excision alone or radiotherapy with no boost, stratified on the basis of age, margins, size, grade, and tamoxifen use. And if you look at the patients, you see that they had a median age of 58 years. Again, these were small DCIS, about 70% of them were less than a centimeter in size on mammogram. And you see the margin distribution here, almost half of them had a completely negative re-excision, much higher intent to use tamoxifen in this study than in the ECOG study. And if you look at the results, what you see at five years is that the local failure rate in the no RT group was 3.2% compared to less than 1% in the RT group. And this difference was highly statistically significant. So even in good risk DCIS, you get a reduction in local failure with the use of radiotherapy. Perhaps the most interesting thing to me out of these two studies is the fact that if you look at the ECOG study, low to intermediate grade group, and the RTOG study, same entry criteria, but there's a twofold difference in the rate of local recurrence. And so the difference between 6% and less than 1% is obviously considerably more noteworthy than the difference between 3% and 0.4%. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we still have problems with traditional histopathologic factors as predictors of recurrence. So I think whether you think that there is a, this benefit is meaningful or not um, is obviously a matter of personal values. Patients have told us that very small benefits are meaningful to them. You accept that for survival benefit, but local events to patients are equated with breast cancer death, even though they don't necessarily. So that brings me to an effort to try and define in a more reproducible way a good risk subset of DCIS, which was this study, which was presented at San Antonio last year, which is the use of a multi-gene RT-PCR predictor, the oncotype for DCIS, to identify a favorable prognosis group in DCIS. So there was a lot of consternation and confusion about exactly how this gene set was chosen to be the DCIS score. And how it was chosen was they went back to the same NSABP trials that they used for the 21 gene oncotype, and they found blocks that had DCIS coexisting with invasive cancer, and so they did their gene discovery on that tissue as well as on a small subset of uh, DCIS not from a randomized trial. And in contrast to what they did in Oncotype DX, they looked for genes that were purely prognostic, not necessarily predictive, which is how they came up with PR rather than ER in their score. So you see that basically this score is very heavily weighted toward genes that are related to proliferation plus PR and then the standard reference genes. And they evaluated this both as a continuous bear variable and with cut points of low, intermediate, and high. And so when you look at this, what they found was that yes, this genetic score did distinguish some groups of DCIS that behaved differently. And this was done on that ECOG trial that I just showed you of those small, favorable DCISs treated with excision alone. So it is not surprising that of this entire sample, 246 of these 300 patients fell into the low risk group. But you see, if you consider any breast recurrence, the low risk group is statistically different from the intermediate and high risk group. And if you consider only invasive recurrences, which are what we care about because that's where the potential for breast cancer death is, then you see that the high risk score really stands out here from the other two groups. <laughs> 
And just like the Oncotype DX is a continuous variable, this score also is a continuous variable as well. And these are simply the plots showing those risks of recurrence. And when you put it into a model with other things that we know predict outcome in DCIS, what you see is that this score retains statistical significance even after you include tumor size and menopausal status in the model. So, and this is simply an exploratory analysis looking at different groups, pre- and post-menopausal, size of a centimeter more or less, margin width, grade, and the use of tamoxifen, and in all of these, the score acts in the same way. So, should we all start using the DCIS recurrence score to determine who needs radiotherapy or not. And that is not something we are doing in our practice at Memorial at this point in time for several reasons. First of all, we think that the prognostic value of this score needs to be evaluated in an independent data set that is more widely representative of DCIS as a whole. That is, it includes big DCISs, it includes less favorable DCISs, but more importantly, does this predict the benefit of radiotherapy? If it shows that in the low risk score group, there is no benefit from radiotherapy, that would be a clinically very meaningful piece of information to have. Um, and so that I think are the key unanswered questions regarding the use of this score at this point in time. So then just to move on to a couple things that people often ask about DCIS, when do you do sentinel node biopsy? Well, of course, DCIS lacks the ability to metastasize, so the rationale for any axillary surgery is the risk of unsampled invasive cancer, which is about 15% when you make the diagnosis of DCIS on a core biopsy. Axillary recurrence in pure DCIS is extremely uncommon. We have long-term follow-up from NSABP B17 and B24, and look at these numbers, three of 620 patients with DCIS at 15 years had an axillary uh, failure, and even fewer in B24, six of 1,799 at 11 years. So there is no good reason for sampling uh, DC, or the axillary nodes in DCIS. And those low risks are independent of whether you're doing lumpectomy only, lumpectomy with radiotherapy, or lumpectomy, radiotherapy, and tamoxifen. It is an extremely infrequent event in any subset of DCIS. Microinvasive cancer is not DCIS. That is an indication for sentinel node biopsy. And if you're doing a mastectomy where once the breast is off, you can't do the sentinel node biopsy, and because usually that's done for extensive DCIS where the risk of unsampled invasion is high, that is indeed the one standard indication for sentinel node biopsy in DCIS. And then finally, endocrine therapy. We finally saw this year in print, 10 years after it was first presented at San Antonio, the results of the NSABP B24 subset analysis of the effect of tamoxifen broken down by estrogen receptor status. So this was, of course, an unplanned subset analysis on a subsample of the entire trial which showed exactly what we've known about tamoxifen in invasive cancer for a long time, namely that it approximately halved the hazard ratio of having an additional breast cancer event, either invasive or in situ, in the ipsilateral breast or the contralateral breast. This is now seriously old news. We've moved on from that a long time ago. So what about other endocrine therapies? Well, in the MAP3 trial of exemestane for breast cancer risk reduction, there was an arm that allowed DCIS treated by mastectomy. It had only 112 patients in it. There's no subset analysis in that group, but if you look at the overall effect of exemestane, there's again about a 50% reduction in the hazard of recurrence, and I think one can extrapolate that to DCIS at large. 
Other data on aromatase inhibitors will be coming from two specific trials that were done in DCIS selected on the basis of estrogen receptor status, which are the B35 and the IBIS-2. So that will give us a little bit more definitive estimates. The one drug I can't get too excited about in DCIS is raloxifene, although we know in the STAR trial of high-risk postmenopausal women that it was equivalent to tamoxifen overall and had a better side effect profile. If you look specifically at its effects on preventing DCIS, it was actually somewhat worse than tamoxifen, so starting with this drug in somebody who has DCIS doesn't make any sense to me. So the final thing I would say about endocrine therapy is many women have the idea in their heads that if they have breast conserving therapy, they have to get endocrine therapy, which they don't want, and therefore they choose mastectomy. And while it is certainly true that the most favorable risk-benefit ratio is in women with two breasts, particularly if they're premenopausal, the way I look at endocrine therapy in DCIS is it is an option for women who want to minimize their risk of future breast cancer events, but because the absolute magnitude of benefit is quite small, it's in the 5% or less range in most women on recurrence, with no survival impact, it's not a necessity for the treatment of DCIS at all. Thank you.